an investigative journalist and author of the famous book, The Slaughter. Please uh, give a warm hand to Mr. Ethan. challenge me if he likes and so forth. That's, that's fine because those same thoughts are undoubtedly running through all of your minds as well. However, said, having said that, I am going to give a rather basic talk, uh, sort of, uh, because there's two things that convince me personally about the uh, Oregon Arbiter case after having worked at it for many years, about 13 years. Uh, one is just the facts, and I'll be getting into a few of those very minimally. The second is, uh, the narrative, the overarching narrative of the story. Now, it's an interesting thing to look at this picture. It's an odd picture, uh, and we don't really know where it comes from. Uh, but it's very interesting. It, it, these are bodies. Uh, these are large character posters. They describe what the person did, and that's why they've been shot down here. Uh, there's bodies back here as well. You can see them. And look at the expressions. I, mean, I know it's hard to see, but look at the expressions. This man's trying to look very official. This man is probably a weaker, in fact, based on the mustache. And he's trying to treat it as if it's a joke or sort of a big party. Uh, this man is looking right at you defiantly. And the reason he's looking defiantly at you is because of this. He's the man who just did the shooting. This is, uh, he wears this to prevent his uniform from perceiving from getting the back splatter from the blood to the back of the head as it shoots out. Uh, and he's done the, committed the crime. Now, this isn't even an illegal picture. In China, this is supported. This is capital punishment. But what's really interesting about it is that these facial expressions are something you can see in every authoritarian state since photography was developed. And what else is interesting is that only in Sweden, all I have to do is go 500 miles from here, down south, or 500 miles east, and maybe just a place like Prague or Berlin or something like that. And people have no question about organ harvesting. All I have to do is go west back to where I live in London, and everybody goes, well, this is sort of impossible. Well, how could this possibly be happening? So it's very interesting, because I, I, I talk to a lot of different audiences, and I pick up on the signals. And the, uh, the signals from anybody who's been under a communist state are completely different. Okay. Uh, and that goes, by the way, for any refugees in the audience who come from communist states as well. Uh, so there's a huge difference, even around this room, with the people who you're sitting next to. You already have divided opinions, right from the beginning. All right, enough about that. These are the new executioners in China. Most of the executions are now done by doctors. Or at least they play the major role. In some cases, now, what Amber was just describing, the MAT system, which is obviously very efficient, uh, a very efficient system, a fast system to gain organs. But in many cases, there are, but there are hospitals throughout China, and they are all doing human organs, such as these. And the only reason we have this picture is because supposedly these human organs were voluntary donations. OK, but even here, this isn't exactly the most pleasant picture I've ever seen of uh, doctors. Now, I'm going to say one last thing as a directive. There's no reason to believe anything I have to say. This is a toxic subject. Skepticism is welcome. It is only appropriate to enter such an investigation as if you were walking on the moon, as far as I'm concerned. But you will never be persuaded by what I have to say, what Edward has to say, what any of our other great speakers have had to say, until you read something. OK? And I don't care if it's one of these books that I'm going to mention. It could be uh, any one of these things, or even a long-form essay of 5,000 words. But you must sit down and read something at some point. Bloody Harvest was the first study. Uh, David Kilgore and uh, David Matis did it. It was seminal in its time. I, my study came out in 2014. In between, there was a book uh, that's also well worth reading called uh, State Organs. Uh, 
this was the update in 2016. It was a combination of the two books, but it was a completely different approach, was to try to just get one thing right, the transplant volume of China on an annual basis. What is the size of that thing? Now, the most recent development is the London China Tribunal. If you really don't want to read a book, and I, I know books are way out of fashion these days, but if you don't want to read a book, well, that one's right on the web. London China Tribunal, and there it is, the final summary judgment, and it's well worth reading, and it's well worth watching the video if you don't feel like reading it, because uh, Jeffrey Knight's arguably the best human rights prosecutor to, in the world today, uh, came out very clearly saying, this is happening, and this was after a year and a half of going through all the documentation and approximately 50 witnesses. Now, but this is what I'm working on now. Do we have the lights down? Thanks. Just a bit. This is what I'm working on now, which is going to be a bit more global. <laughs> but the story essentially starts out here, and this is not a comprehensive list in any way. This was just the list from my book, and it's just to give you kind of a map and a sense of things. And the, the hospital was just mentioned by uh, Denver, which is right up here, the Urumqi Central Railway Hospital. The Western Mountain Execution Grounds is where he took out the liver and kidneys of a man whose heart was still beating. Uh, there are other places, the Air Force Hospital uh, that I mentioned, and, and so forth. And here's, this is really getting into Qinghai, which also <coughs> Denver mentioned too, which is important because for many years, this is where Tibetans were protected from the virus. Now, it is important to recognize that when they were harvesting prisoners, this was considered a very acceptable thing to do in China. Now, you may not consider capital punishment acceptable, but I am, as you can tell, I'm also American as well as a British citizen. And uh, my wife is from Texas. And they don't think anything of, you know, it's, it's, if you have a terrible criminal or a terrible murderer, it's perfectly appropriate to put them on death row. In fact, in this picture, why do we have this picture? Such a violent picture. Does anybody know? It's a tie. No. This woman killed her own husband while he was sleeping and cut his throat. This picture was published to show justice was being done. Okay? That's why we have the picture. China does not, did not hide these things for many years. But they did hide the fact that the organs were being stripped. This was a, one of my first witnesses, a policeman, who actually admitted going up and looking at the bodies afterwards and said that the organs had just been stripped out. Uh, uh, he was shocked by this. The, but the real action, as Enver described it, starts in Xinjiang, or what the Uyghurs call East Turkestan, in this region. And we've already gone through his story, but there's another person's story as well. This man's name is Nijat. Nijat was the sole leader in a public security bureau unit, that is the secret police of China. And their job was to suppress uh, leaders that they considered to have terrorist inclinations and so forth. And Nijat was aware in 2000, I believe he actually heard this himself, but he decided to put it in a third person. He described screams coming from the hospital vans that were parked at the execution grounds. As, as if someone was alive, or as he put it, as if somebody was going to hell. Uh, so this was something he was quite aware of. By 2006, he was made, he had a conversation with the chief surgeon, which explains the whole thing. He basically said, yes, but cut it with the still alive. So. so this is a well-known point, I think it, we could say that this did start, the live organ harvesting started in Xinjiang. Now, there's Ember. But the real point is, when did the organ harvesting of political prisoners happen? Well, there's a case back in 1975 where there's a uh, Chinese dissident, and she was disemboweled in front of everybody, or 76 rather, and she was disemboweled, and uh, they took out her organs and supposedly tried to put them into somebody. But this was really Maoist theater. This wasn't serious business. This is when it gets serious. The Gulje incident is a city in a, uh, a city in Xinjiang in 2007. Now, this was one of the policemen who worked there, Bacha. 
and I talked to him for a long time, and he's, he was made to give up his gun, and he became aware that they were actually starting to use the prisoners as a fire for organ harvest. At the same time, another doctor, a nurse in, in Gulja, um, was aware that they were, I, I know this sounds a little spectacular, but she really had no reason to say this, and she was terrified to talk to me because she had family in Xinjiang. She's in Europe somewhere, I won't say where. Uh, that they were actually killing the second Uyghur child. When the second Uyghur child had been born, they were giving them a drug and the kid would die within three days. This became quite common. Now, the, at the same time she got involved in one of the very first cases of a political activist, a young Uyghur activist, about 16, who was carved up for his organs on behalf of some very wealthy people. It's a long and complex story. I won't get into it here. What we do know is that there was... Uh, a witness who I can't show here, again, but he is a doctor, and he was told in not too long after the Gulji incident to go into the hospital, uh, uh, go into the political prisoner wing, rather, of the room of the hospital, and take blood samples. Now, I've just used a kind of stock photo here, but this is what he essentially did, and there was a panic within the room. The, the, the Uyghur sort of said, how can you do this? You're a Uyghur, like us. How can you do this? such a thing? He said, this is just for your health. It's just for your health. We just need to take blood samples, that's all. Now, he was told what this was about. There were six high-ranking Chinese Communist Party cadres. They'd arrived at a room. They checked into the hotel, and they were expecting to get new kidneys and livers. Uh, so right from the beginning, with the political prisoners, we have the influence of the Chinese Communist Party. This is not rogue doctors. This is state-run, right from the beginning. And after those six officials left, another six took their place. And then, from his perspective, it kind of died out. And I think that's where we want to get into the next part of the story, which kind of is here. This is Beijing, this is Tianjin. Here's a place, Shenyang. Some of you may know some of these locations or have some sense of it, Changchun. This is the heartland of Fala Gok. This is where it developed. Uh, back in uh, 1992. And originally Falun Gong was kind of an urban phenomenon in Changchun, but it eventually uh, went through every class in China. It moved across every boundary that it was, educational boundaries. It went from illiterate, literally illiterate peasants all the way up to top university professors and officials. Uh, it moved into uh, <coughs> Very wealthy people and some really poor people, like these people. But there was one thing that really worried the Chinese Communist Party. It's this boy. Because boys like that were growing up to be men. PLA soldiers were doing this. Top Chinese Communist Party officials. So that was what terrified, or at least worried, the uh, Chinese Communist Party about this movement. And in 1999, this is taken in 1999, just before the crackdown. This was what morning exercise looks like in Dalian City. It's a beautiful coastal city in China. Uh, and within that year, people were already starting to be put here. This is Shenyang Prison City under construction. These are, uh, you can see these are many places where they're keeping people, and these are some of the other <coughs> buildings. This is more what it looks like today. It's filled in quite a bit. Uh, and they were starting to be moved into these hospitals. Now, how do we know all that? Well, we know that because we have a series of witnesses who came out describing medical examinations that made no sense from a medical standpoint. Uh, uh, the, the classic one is when they look at their eyes, and they wouldn't do a peripheral vision test or a focus test, nothing involving actual brain function or the ability to see, only the tissue that we call the corneas. Simply that. Uh, the probing of the uh, probing of the kidneys, uh, the probing of the uh, uh, liver, the EKG, the lung test, all of these were part of a sample, and they, they were obviously very worried about this, but it became far more explicit. This is Juan Zhou. Uh, uh, Guangzhou Jail. This right here is where the buses would line up on a six, every six months to take the Falun Gong practitioners away, the ones that they had determined were going to be harvested for their organs. It was known by 2005. This was no <coughs> longer secret within this jail. 
They were blatant about it. They were like, if you're falling down, you better behave because we're going to cut out your organs. Uh, other prisoners would tease them about it. This was normalized. Uh, now, I can't get into all the details here. Again, I recommend the reading. But let me give you a sense of the scale here, because this other than this, this guy in the middle, the, this picture is a pretty accurate representation, at least of female falling down practitioners, uh, refugees. All of these women were in labor camp. All of them were tortured. One of them, I'm not saying which one, was uh, sexually abused severely. Uh, this one, <coughs> John, was examined for her organs over and over again. Okay. We don't know why. We don't actually know fully. I think she signed a statement saying she hated falling wrong and loved the Communist Party and probably told them something and got out. She did not die. She's now with her husband uh, in Vancouver. I've seen her since many times. This was taken in Bangkok many years ago. Uh, the next group, that was, so that was about 2001, 2002, when we started getting these examinations. And it's about one in, in, one in five, initially. And then about half of those people start disappearing. So we're not talking about extraordinary numbers in the beginning. We're really not. But they're, they're well, now you've got to understand. I've done my best estimates on follow on in detention. And that is not an easy business. It's, it's, it's very much, you asked a question uh, about, um, how many camps? So nobody who's in this system can possibly know that. They know who's in their, in their cell. They know who's in their, maybe in their cell block. But they don't know much more than that. And so the attempts to sort of figure that out to refugees are very, very difficult. Nonetheless, I did 50 refugees, and for kind of a wartime sample, I think it's reasonable to say that <coughs> we, have, we can make a calculation that approximately half a million to a million Falun Gong were in detention. Why? Because we know that four to five million, three to five million, uh, the Lao Dai system with China is about three to five million at any given time. Okay? That's something we know through the great work of uh, the late uh, Harry Wu. Now, <coughs> the Tibetans come online. So Falun Gong comes online for her organs about the end of 2000. And the Tibetans come online about 2003. They're coming in from Lhasa. There's not much hospital facilities initially. These are two who got out alive. Uh, it's very explicit. Mostly monks were being used. Uh, and really, we don't have much more to say about it other than we know that the house Christians were also coming online at that time, at least Eastern Lightning, uh, one specifically. And we know that because guards would refer. They'd say, you know, oh, here comes some of those little fellows. Here come some of those little lightnings, I mean, Eastern lightning. And they would say, now you guys are going for exam, right? Nobody else. Nobody else would get these examinations. Just fall and go. And in this case, Eastern lightning. Why? Well, part of it is that these people are considered healthier. They don't drink. They don't smoke. By Chinese standards, it may not mean a lot to you, but this they consider this to be very healthy Qigong, OK? That keeps you, uh, <laughs> keeps you fit. Uh, so part of it was the health problem, but there was another problem, too. This was a very vulnerable population. As David Maidas put it, a lot of the fallen gone did not want to get their families in trouble. So they simply, when they were asked by the guards, who are you? They'd say, what's your name? They'd say, I'm fallen gone practitioner. Where are you from? The cosmos. Okay? This was a ser the best answer they could come up with because they didn't want their families to be persecuted. They didn't want their families to lose their jobs. They didn't want their kids to be chased out of school. They didn't want any of that. So this became this huge, floating, extremely vulnerable population. Their families didn't know where they were. Uh, they had no recourse. They had no purchase on the system whatsoever. And people like this exploited. This man, Bo Xi Wai, was almost the new emperor of China. He was, had a good run at the presidency. This was his right hand man. Okay. Wang Li Jun. He was the most famous policeman in all of China at that time. This is Wang Li Jun directing traffic in an organ harvest. He had his own chop shop. He had a special hospital which he used uh, in Jilin City. It was very close to Dalian, which was also a center of organ harvesting and a center of plastination. And he was, this was him. Uh, why do we have these pictures? 
because he was given an award for a new lethal injection method. That is, you would use a perfusion strategy, which would keep the organs alive and oxygenated. You'd remove them, and then you'd close down the patient. Believe it or not, that kind of thing's important uh, in China. The, the lethal injection method that will not come in until the very last minute. Actually, this becomes a big issue in Taiwan, too, but that's another story. Uh, what's interesting about this is that Wang Lujun, when this was revealed, or at least it was revealed in Falun Gong sources, it led to a massive crisis. Now, I'm not going to get into all that here, but you can see something happened because one would Baidu, which is the search engine of China, release these terms, live harvest, Wang Lijun live harvest, for 24 hours. It was very simple. They were saying, how far do you want to go with this? Every, you know, we're, we can reveal the whole thing. One faction is saying to another, we can reveal the whole thing, and the Chinese Communist Party will fall. This is the most toxic issue for the Chinese Communist Party. And, but what happens? Right in the middle of this, there's this odd thing. Public declaration to end organ donations from executed prisoners within three to five years. Who gives that? The master of ceremonies of organ harvesting. Um, he gives this directive, it's more public, front page, Wall Street Journal, okay? Washington Post, front page, New York Times, front page. This is not some hidden thing. In the middle of all this, they're suddenly saying, we're going to do something about this. We recognize we have a problem. Who helps them out with the problem in 2012? The head of the TTS, Francis Del Monaco, standing next to Wang Jifu, the master of ceremonies. Uh, with some guys from the Hong Kong Chamber of Commerce. Well, obviously, open bar night. Uh, <laughs> this, we were doing very well in, I, I, just a little aside. In 2012, we were doing very well. We had a lot of countries which were looking at cutting off our tourism to China, and we had the and we had the you. We were all traveling around, and we were getting invited everywhere. Isn't that true? Uh, we did a tour of England. I mean, we must have hit 10 cities. Uh, what happened? The doctor stepped in and said, we're taking care of a daddy's home. It's all going to be taken care of, no problem. Well, that's something I'd love to talk about in the questioning, but let's get into volume. Let's change the subject. This is volume. This is, in 2014, advertising on the web. This has been on the web for three years. It's in English. Okay, so these are advertising to foreign organ tourists. Come and get your organs. This happens to be... Tianjin Central. See the picture? Same place. Uh, Tianjin Central does about 5,000, has about 5,000 beds. We estimate that it's doing, well, it's, it's, it's basically doing, well, it's doing about, it's 500 beds, and we're basically, or 700 beds. We're estimating that it does about 5,000 beds. This is one hospital. Now, you need some perspective on this. China is claiming they only did 10,000 transplants at the time. How could one hospital be doing? We knew 700 hospitals were performing these operations. And in fact, so when we started looking at this, and this is one mistake we started to do on, on the line. They brag. They love to talk about volume. They love to talk about how many they're doing. How many. Uh, it, it's like bumper harvest. Uh, and they put the pictures out there. And you can see these are all different sorts of pictures. And, and but where were the organs coming from? We estimated, and that was our 2016 study. And it's hard to refute because it's over 700 days. Those, it shows pretty conclusively that it's at least 60,000 transplants per year, not 10,000. And that's probably more like 100,000. And I know that it's more than 100,000 because I, I personally limited those numbers. Uh, just on the simple <coughs> point that there's a tendency in China to exaggerate things about know, this. The fish was this big. Uh, now, this woman. Okay, so later cases. It continues. Follows on. There's 500 falling off in a single day are given organ examinations. Uh, how many disappear afterwards? That's a matter of conjecture. One of the most difficult things is to get the disappearance rate right. We don't know if these people are just moved to another camp. We don't know that. But we do know that people disappear after these examinations. And I'll get to why that's important in a second. Now, you're all familiar with the surveillance state that China's become and Xinjiang and so forth. And you're all probably somewhat familiar with the fact that back, all the way back in 2009, 2008, they started arresting males, male Uyghurs in Xinjiang, on a rapid pace. 
<coughs> but what you may not be aware of as much is, is what Edward was talking about. In 2016, the entire Uyghur population is given blood tests. Approximately 15 million people, anybody above 12, 12 and above, is given a blood test. They're forced. Now, they're also given a DNA test, but I think that's actually less significant. The DNA test is good for surveillance. It could be very good for organ harvesting. But blood testing is a sure thing that every doctor understands. It's a great way to do tissue matching. Now, you could say, well, wait, 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 wait hang on. You're supposed to jump in here at this point and say, well, well maybe there was an infectious disease around. And that would be a legitimate reason to give blood tests. The problem is Xinjiang is more than half Chinese, Han Chinese. And none of those people are given blood tests. Just the Uyghurs. Only the Uyghurs. There is no infectious disease around. These are populations that are completely mixed together. Why would you do this? It's racial. This is a racial attack, and I'm really pleased that our previous witness said that. She didn't say this is just an attack on Islam. This is a racial attack. The hatred, the intensity of the interviews I've been doing, it, it's amazing. Now, we are all familiar with what happened after that. The camps, out of nothing, they grow their mushroom into this size. Uh, Here's a map of the camps. It's actually pretty accurate. Uh, it may be understated. The, uh, and this, of course, is people starting to be, this is after prayers, and they started to do, they were forcing them to do it after prayers as well, to do blood tests. And this is a crematory. So what we have, and now we finally have a new phenomenon. This is the last picture you'll see of this, because all of the cemeteries are being wiped out. Now, people have looked at that and said, well, this is an attack on Islam, and that's certainly true. This is an attack on Uyghur heritage, of course that's true. But it's also an attack on the very idea that you can bring these people back, that you can examine their DNA. Once you've taken their DNA, the whole point is to use it <coughs> and destroy it. Okay? And that's why this crematorium issue that Enver brought up is so critical. Why would you have 50 security guards in a crematorium? I've never heard of such a thing of you. How many do you have in Sweden, in Stockholm, in your crematorium? Two, three, 50? OK, and that's just one of nine. We're nine planned crematoriums in the Xinjiang region. Now, I'm just going to get into the close here. So I'm just going to bring up a couple of witnesses I've been interviewing recently. Uh, this is a woman who testified at the, at the London China Tribunal. And I went back and read through her testimony again. What she describes is not only systematic rape, but a, syst a system of putting people through tests, medical tests, aimed at their organs, exactly the same as Thalangar, just slightly more sophisticated methods. Uh, and then they start disappearing. They come out with a list, and they actually use a, a, an orange vest that they have to put on, and those people disappear within three or four days. Now, why, why am I concentrating on that? Well, because to me, the interesting thing is both the continuity and the differences. If, you know, you might say organ harvesting the development state with Xinjiang. Organ harvesting 1.0, the working system, that was all and gone. And it's amazing. I mean, you know, we didn't, you're, I'm sure you'll talk about it, but the growth of the hospitals in China is explosive. This is something we went through in our 2016 report. I mean, this goes from, uh, they can barely do a liver transplant, something they're doing, you know, something they're doing 5,000, 8,000 within a couple of years. I mean, it's utterly amazing. And anybody who looks at that report will, will see for themselves. Now, this is organ harvesting 2.0. It is faster, it's better managed, it's quicker, okay? It's like just like a good new computer system. This guy, same basic story. He also uh, interviewed with the tribunal. This woman, we just saw her tonight. Now, she described it very vividly in, in my when I interviewed her, that they basically would do a list, it would come back and have pink check marks, she'd see it a day and a half afterwards, and then those people would disappear. How many people disappear? It's not huge, but from my back of the envelope calculation, I'm looking at about 25,000 to 50,000 Uyghurs being harvested for the organs per year. This is not the Holocaust, but it's a slow motion Holocaust, and that's what it's been all along. The, finally, this woman, call her the Iron Lady, I'm her name right now is in Istanbul. And what she described is something, well, she describes rape that I, I can't get out of my mind. But beyond that, she describes a system 
when she was 12 years old, they examined her for her organs, her entire family. Eventually, her entire family was killed. Uh, they, she believes her brothers were harvested. She saw them shot in front of her, uh, not lethally. Same thing. Just leave your patient with some shots in the Look, these are preliminary findings. I cannot, I'm not going to come out with this number 25 to 30 to 50. I'm just trying to give you a sense of where my thinking is right now. It's a long road. It's hard. Everything we look at is a little late. It's like looking at a star. We don't know what's happened since then. We're always getting the information late. But I do want to close with one very simple idea. The onus is on the people who are denying this. Okay. It is now up to them to respond. I don't want to hear any more from the doctors who've gone to a one hospital in China and declared it was OK. It's one stage managed visit. This is not the answer. The answer is for them to look just the same way I'm looking with a skeptical eye and say, what is really going on here? China's not giving us any answers. China's giving us no access to the numbers, not anyone. There is no access. These people. Everybody who is involved in China does it because they think, I don't want my access to be taken away. This is always the idea. I worked in China. I felt that way. I was making good money in China. Does it matter to me at this point? No, I've blown my access. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got my burn notice. But the point is, you don't get much from access. You can get something from these people if they're not lying. And the whole trick is to interview them and make sure they're not lying. And that's why this interview lasted 15 hours. And there's going to be another 15 hours coming up. Okay, so I just want to say this is not a, uh, you know, as people have slowly recognized, this is not a, uh, uh, this is not the problem that's going away. And uh, that's all. And you, you never interrupt me. So. What happened? <laughs> I never got that two second pause, the inhale, before I could cut in. Uh, very interesting to hear. Can you give us uh, an estimation? I, I'm sure it's impossible, but since you, you are into this uh, deep, uh, of course there are uh, donors uh, that volunteer in China, right? And there is this market for the organs. What's this? What's the percentage of volunteers versus uh, yeah. the other groups you mentioned? Right, right. I, I can't say for sure, but let's let's give it a shot at this, okay? With you, you know, I'm just guessing here to a certain extent. China has been claiming that they're all coming from voluntary organs since 2015. That's been at least. Their explanation has been disproven by Jacob Levy, Matt Robertson, and the statistician's name that escapes me, who wrote a fantastic article in a major medical journal showing that this was actually uh, the rise of voluntary donations was actually based on a perfect equation, which is impossible. <laughs> it's like the, nothing works that way in real life. Okay, so no, there is no there is no perfect. Uh, maybe when you start a really good car. A good bubble, you know, and you can accelerate at the right rate. You can get something like that, but not voluntary. Donations. So, what's your professional guess? My professional guess is that they're probably pulling out uh, twenty percent in voluntary donations. They're probably getting something like twenty percent still out of prisoners. That is hardcore criminals. And I'll be honest with you guys, I'm, my wife's from Texas. I don't lose sleep over hardcore criminals, but I do lose sleep over the sixty percent, which I believe are mostly. Leaders now, but also Falun Gong, because there's a st still a fair amount of Falun Gong in the system. Uh, the fact is, there's a new market, the Saudis. The Saudis do not want pork eaters. They want women. <laughs> and therefore, they, this, the leaders are very attractive to the Saudis. Uh, that's a very wealthy market. Up till now, it's mainly been the Japanese, uh, and of course, South Korea. And to some extent, I hate to say it, but the Germans. Uh, and but the Saudis have entered this market in the organ tourist market. And the organ tourist market is very important because they're paying about ten, five to ten times what everybody else is paying. In some cases, like Saudis or Japanese, they pay 30 or 40 times because they hit the bargain. But this is the situation. Uh, 
Well, but this but is, these are rough yeah. guesstimates. I mean, I'm, I'm just giving you my best feeling for it. Right. Uh, uh, well, <coughs> can I just cut you from one minute? Chinese voluntary organ donation registration until just now is 1,100,000. 1,100,000 volunteers. And that is registered. Yeah. And actually, as a carried out, it is 7,000 organ and yeah. cases and 5,000. Uh, okay, that was the way China handled this yeah. by doing a very Western thing. They, okay. they actually created an app so you could volunteer your, your organs. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to ask you to pick the brain yeah. of the Chinese government yeah. and explain to us why and how they are able to deny every single piece of evidence that you have presented? Well, I think there's two <coughs> answers. The one is um, the three answers, really, but two main answers are they're able to deny it because they cut off all access. We don't have access to them. The, they don't even give us any of the same access to numbers. The Transplantation Society, under oath, and I was sitting next to Francis Del Monaco when he said this, was asked point blank, do you have any access to the military hospitals in China? Which is, of course, the fault of these operations. And he said, no. And they said, how can you tell us that it's reformed? And he said, I can't. But I've looked into the eyes of the young surgeons and blah, 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 and I know they want to reform, and that's, that's probably true, what he was saying. Uh, Francis Del is not an evil guy. He's, he's just a guy who wants this to work in sort of a Kissinger way. He wants to, you know, like Kissinger would like to draw up saying sort of like a great thing. That's his feeling about it. Unfortunately, we're not getting any answers from them. The second thing is the West has made it easy. Okay? We have not asked the questions. Oregon tourists don't ask the questions at all. The Germans aren't asking questions about their own tourists going over there. Schengen Central may be the biggest. Uh, the, they may be the biggest population in Shenzhen Central, that hospital I was showing you. That's the information we're getting. Where are the Germans on this? The heart surgeons. It's done through a network of heart surgeons. Why aren't they being questioned? This is bizarre. We would never accept this. During the Cold War, we didn't allow anyone to have any contact with Soviet psychiatrists. Nothing. Because we knew they were putting dissidents in mental hospitals. We knew very little about those mental hospitals. We know much more about Chinese transplant hospitals today. But there's a big difference. Russia was poor and China's rich. Okay. Uh, thank you again with a warm applause. <laughs> so, big hand for uh, Dr. Ben Nicole.
I always feel uh, I'm not good enough those uh, those knowledge I have. So I have um, uh, I, I will uh, seek better report, seek better. Oh, at that time in China, uh, there there are Qigong cultivation methods. So I I seek in Qigong methods. Uh, finally, I found uh, Falun uh, I heard my uh, my family or my friends they they got um, making very good effect, very good result at practicing them. So I, I thought, why, why shouldn't I try myself? Uh, so very quickly, uh, I, I, I feel the, the benefit of um, my, my health make it better, very, very, very quickly. After I very, uh, start practicing. <coughs> oh, I also know uh, the importance uh, to be a good person, uh, uh, try to accelerate the nature of emotion. We, 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 we uh, uh, truthfulness, uh, compassion, or awareness, awareness. So my life was very, very happy. But uh, everything changed. Everything changed. The comes party for the uh, persecution. Um, for for me, well, for, for, for me, uh, I was detained uh, in five occasions. Uh, I suffered a lot. A beaten uh, in cold room without heat. Hungry, uh, Thursday, and uh, uh, I feel uh, pressure from all the society. But the Communist Party try to <coughs> try to make the whole society against against us. But uh, the cyst occasion is, uh, was, was the, uh, the worst, the worst. Uh, that is uh, in April, April uh, 2008. Uh, I distributed persecution information to public and uh, arrested. At that time I was I was beaten for uh, for head. Uh, okay, I lost conscious consciousness. I don't know how, how, how long I lost consciousness. Uh, so then I, uh, at the police station, <coughs> the police uh, um, questioned me in uh, my name or address. Uh, I I thought maybe I have chance to, f to flee. Okay, also there is uh, of, um, there are also something uh, in my home. Some yeah, I don't want police to, to negotiate to come to my my home. Um, so I, I did not tell them. I did not tell the police. The police tried to hit me. Very, very hard. Um, I was beaten of four to the ground for the pen, very, very bad. Uh, they, they beat me quite a long time. After, after that, I, I, I could not stop right for, 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 for my wound, wrist of legs. 
10 days at the North Store. But uh, I lost, I, I, I told, I told please of my, my nano press. So I sent to force labor camp. Um, before I, I told the policeman my, my name address, and the police said to me, uh, if you do not tell us your name or address, uh, you are going to be sent to a collecting uh, camp and place where you were never allowed to go out. So I, I, I don't understand why. Well, there are things I can't at a place that many uh, people cannot go out. So I, I did not be the place now at that time. But now I, I think that is very reasonable. But I also concern that many Falun practitioners, they don't want the place to to disturb, to, to persecute their family members or their companies. They, they, they try to, uh, to protect, protect them. So they, 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 they find it they did not say their name or address. So it's possible, as that policeman said, they sent to a concentration place that a camp of never can come out. <coughs> so I was in the forced labor camp. There we were forced to do a lot of first labor. Uh, sometimes from, from early morning to, to, uh, to night. Only have rest on the meal times. Uh, okay, my name is Mr. But, but the, the, um, in June or July, to, uh, to, to, to southern edge, uh, dozens of Falun practitioners, practitioners and I were forced to uh, receive medical examination. Um, I don't see other uh, other uh, other people in the labor camp, but uh, Falun practitioners. Um, there are uh, several medical prof professionals came from outside did the examination, which included blood test. I had blood drawn from a right elbow wheel. After I practiced Valuable, very healthy. I did not need to go to the hospital to get injection. But but after that time, they, uh, they, there is something left in, in my arm. Even today, I'm hurt. Quite expensive, I couldn't do it. Put my fist, so I'm so big. So, so, so. Fist car. But, so, after the medical examination, I did not get any result. So, it was strange, very, very strange. So, uh, at that time, I don't know why. So we are persecuted, so we are tortured. They, they cannot care about our health. Uh, so it's not for our health. Uh, um, I, uh, I, I was in the labor camp um, for two, for 14, 14 months. Okay. So um, uh, yeah, I left the, the camp. The police, uh, the police continue, continue 
will control me. Um, so I left China, I go to went to Malaysia, study. Uh, uh, I got a visa, study visa to Malaysia, and uh, with the help of UNHCR of Sweden, I came to Sweden, two thousand six. Okay, uh, I I also have contact with with friends in China. Um, one of my friend, um, uh, his name is Meng 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 Jianming. Um, Han Han, uh, he he left a message for his four uh, thousand seven. Uh, the message is he is more more uh, more painter. Of prison. Oh, uh, so after, after that, after that, he disappeared. Uh, we we, were, we, we, uh, we know each other in the labor camp. Okay, so it's, uh, there are many things. So, but time's limited. Uh, Okay, I I was uh, finished. Well, uh, can you give you a hand for this. And what, uh, uh, what are you doing today? What's your profession? Uh, I, I I work some art pictures too. Uh, even for a <laughs> So you work full time? Um, uh, if I work, and you have a uh, clinic? Uh, yes. If I work, a full book out. Uh, yeah. If I, I don't work, I, I have a rest. You're fully booked. <laughs> you work. Yes. And then finally, um, you, you touched on it. You have friends in China. Do you ski, uh, still keep in touch with them? And can you tell us anything about how they're doing? Your your Falun friends. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I have enough enough uh, friends. Uh, he he's nice Li 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 Jingzhou. Uh, he, he he was a singer uh, of Spera uh, Gita, of singer in uh, of Olympic Fest, of Olympic uh, occasion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he. He had yacht uh, from birth, from birth, yacht problem. Okay, he practiced on so so he broke, but he okay, yacht okay. Yeah. So he is very happy, so many. But uh, Very, very thin. Very, very thin. Only the skin meet, uh, meet the, the beer. <coughs> okay. When he left the labor camp, about uh, maybe no, uh, a few months, uh, he, he left. Mm. He left the world. He died. He died. <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for sharing that sad story. Um. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Matthias Bremstedt, as Volker said, and I'm the chairman of the Swedish Tibet Committee. Um, the Swedish Tibet Committee has existed for over 50 years and is one of the world's oldest uh, Tibet support groups. Um, we're politically and religiously unaffiliated and only struggling for the human rights of Tibetans. 
and recently also trying to raise awareness of the Uyghurs and helping do as much as we can. And we're also cooperating very much with the Falun Gong and with uh, Shrik, the supporting human rights in China. So we're trying to increase our activities uh, in the Swedish uh, society and trying to uh, raise awareness among politicians and uh, media and the, the general population. That being said, uh, I'm not uh, tenth as interesting as my, my pre previous, uh, previous speakers here. Um, I'm an IT guy. I develop on computers all day, so uh, uh, I don't know the many facts that, that you know about these things. Uh, what I would like to um, just mention shortly is sort of uh, an emotional uh, maybe change of mindset, um, a, a shift of a paradigm shift, you can call it. But, you know, we're talking about China in a way like we've talked about other crises in the history and so forth. Um, but I feel that maybe the time has come to, you know, start comparing communist uh, regime of China with other eras in history. And where does that land us? The, the obvious thing is the Third Reich, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Nazi Germany. And I'm not saying that lightly. I, I don't like to do this comparison. I'm not sensationalist or something. But I think we all have to ask ourselves, how we not come to that point? We're looking at what, what the regime is doing with the Uyghurs. And, uh, organ harvesting, separating children from parents, forced marriages, destroying cemeteries, mosques, and what they've been doing to the Tibetans for many, many years, but in a, in a, a milder fashion maybe, to sort of annihilate a culture, a people, individuals, uh, dissidents. You know, it's a systematic annihilation of not just one people, but of several peoples. And uh, I think we all need to work together to raise awareness about this, because it's not out there in the media. And you, know, if you have to speak with your journalist friends, there's something wrong in the society when this isn't on front page news every day. Matthias, uh, how come you started uh, getting involved in, in Tibet? Well, I've, I've been interested in human rights for a long time. I don't know how long, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit, a bit moved by your speech then. <coughs> um, but for me, uh, a major step was uh, many years ago, I read a book uh, by uh, a Tibetan monk who had suffered 33 years of torture for peacefully protesting, and uh, I heard that he was coming to Sweden, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to meet him. He was at a book fair, so I came there, and I thought for a second that this man would be a broken man. You know, 33 years in prison, he was tortured, he had electrocutions in his mouth, so he lost all his teeth. Uh, un unmentionable torture. and. Uh, sorry. I met this man and he was, you know, a shining light of, of happiness and friendship. And he carried my son and took a picture with him and it meant a lot to me. And I, I understood that, you know, what these people have been through and still to come through with that kind of strength, it's, it's enormous. So uh, from that day I've been more and more engaged and since three years back, two, three years, um, I'm chairman of the organization as well. And I have to say, we're struggling, you know, you would think Tibet today is, according to one organization, the next worst country on earth to live in. It's, it's better than Syria, but it's worse than North Korea. It's that bad. And still, it's, it's not ever in media. Nobody mentions Tibet these days, unless it's, you know, Dalai Lama maybe. But, so it's, it's a frustrating situation, and uh, I beg you all to... Uh, uh, help us out a bit and, and think of Tibet sometimes. And <coughs> so thanks. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, 
But before I ask that, uh, next speaker, you need to hook up, right? So uh, you start hooking up, and then I start uh, uh, asking you the last question. Uh, when you do your tremendous work here, and you, you try to get attention, and you really want this in the media, and, and uh, um, what kind of reaction uh, are you meeting from the official uh, Chinese uh, government? Um, and, 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 and how are they handling your activities? Um, well, we have no direct contact with the Chinese embassy, so they're uh, denouncing us, of course, and uh, they, they uh, harass us. So uh, when we were demonstrating this march, 10th of March, we were walking towards the Chinese embassy and they flew over us with a drone and uh, took pictures of us. They also played very loud Chinese music as they do for Falun Gong and Uyghurs too. These terrible things, you know, breaking against Swedish law, but uh, it was, I, I reported to the police, didn't happen anything. Uh, but more importantly, what the Chinese have, uh, the, the Chinese regime, I should always say, what they've done is they, they placed a uh, spy among the Tibetans. And you have to know that the Tibetan community is around 100 people in Sweden. It's a small, small population, and they're friendly people, they're, and they put a spy in their midst, and that's really such an awful thing to do. It had no logical explanation. It was only to provoke the Tibetans to tell them, we know who you are. And the day after, uh, the vice chairman of, of that organization, the Tibetan organization, not ours, resigned because she had her family back in Tibet and she couldn't work on it. So uh, it's, it's that bad. The China is here provoking us every day, and uh, we have to do something about it. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Professor at the University of Medical Center of Mainz in Germany, an expert, expert, uh, an expert in this field that we've been talking about today. Uh, please uh, welcome uh, Mr. Yudin. Thank you. Thank you. With, uh, of course, a warm applause. And thanks. And um, we have heard uh, the talk of the good market. So if we, we know that uh, the real uh, volume of transplantation in China is much, much higher than the official number. But still, I want to take a step back. I want to um, have a, a very conservative approach. And I will take the official number of China. Um, and let's see the official number of transplantation can be explained by the official source or not. And before 2010, China has no organ donation system, not at all. In the 40 years of uh, transplantation, there, was, um, there were only 130 uh, voluntary donations in the whole land during the 40 years years of time. But the official number of transplantation was said to be uh, 120,000. So um, uh, the official number is uh, about uh, uh, 10,000 a year. And uh, after 2015, we said that uh, all the organs, all the transplants are taken from all voluntary donations. Let's see whether this is possible. So in this, this uh, time period, there is a no organ donation, almost zero, and uh, the Chinese government uh, explained uh, the transplantation. Uh, in the beginning, they said this is all donation, and this is very obvious it was high. Then uh, from 2006 to 2005, they said that all the transplant uh, came from death uh, row per, per prisoners, so execution. So let's see whether it's possible. And just we um, take um, the year of 2004 as uh, a, a, an example. In this year, the official number uh, of transplantation, so liver and uh, kidney combined, was 12,000. So official number. The real number is much higher. So we just take this number. And uh, we know that also that um, in this year there was almost no donation, and also the leading donation so from relatives. Is it is very low to be relevant. So the only official source is execution. 
How much it can it be? We don't know because this is kept as a secret of China. We have shape for the world. China is a member of the, um, uh, of the um, Council of the Human Rights Council in, 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 in the UN. Yeah. And uh, what we know is that uh, in, in that year, in 2004, outside China, the whole world combined execution 400. So how high should it be for China? There is uh, only uh, um, uh, estimations from minimum 2,000 to highest 10,000. 10,000 is very likely and not true. And let's just uh, assume that it is, uh, it is 4,000. With the 5,000 or 4 or 6,000, it doesn't matter. If it was uh, 4,000, so it was 10 times higher than the rest of the world combined. It's high enough, but it's not high enough to supply the organ transplantation. 4,000, so each person has uh, one liver and two kidneys. So we have exactly the number of 12,000 transplants. This fit per perfectly, right? It cannot fit because, and during that time, the organ harvesting from prisoners after execution is illegal. There was a law that uh, stating that uh, uh, the, the consent should be provided by the prisoner, prisoner before execution. They can take the the, um, the organ, but in China, the doctors doctors just took the organ without consent without consent. So this is already admitted by Chinese officials. So this was the situation. They just take, took the organ, it was, uh, it was illegal, and uh, there was no organ donation system, there was also no allocation system, so there was no sharing system. And the, this, all these things happened on the base of relation. So if a doctor knows the judge, so you can have access to the, to the organs, That's why it's, um, it, is, uh, um, it is illegal, it's also only local. Yeah? If uh, there is a, in a city execution, uh, five, five uh, criminal or ten uh, criminal, you have a hospital there, your doctors know the child, so you can go there and you can get a body. So this means that in each occasion, it is about, let's five, say, five criminals and 20 patients, yeah, <coughs> the organs must match. Mm -hmm. So uh, two persons, if it is, they are not relatives, the, the chance that this matches is only 6%. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can see this, all these things happen local, so the real rate of the organs that are really reused for organ transplantation can never be more than 30%. So the majority of the organs were not used. So this means that even it is possible to get 12,000 organs from this 4,000 transplantation. Only a minority of the organs can be used. So this means that this official source cannot explain the organ transplantation in, in China, even the minimum number, the official number. We know that the, the real number is much, much higher. And uh, what is more is that the organs <coughs> can be found within days and weeks. So this was uh, in 2005. Here see that people here, patients wait only for two weeks for a liver. And uh, the military hospitals, only one week. There is an um, uh, international uh, transplant network system center. This is that organs can be found immediately. And this is not a black market uh, dealer. Here you can see. This, is, this uh, uh, institution is founded at the China Medical University, and they have the, same, the only purpose for foreigners. So a university founded an institution professionally only for organ policy. And they say that they can have organs at any time, immediately. So where you can get organs immediately? This must be from living people. They must, it's only a living organ bank can supply organ at such a short time. It is true. We can see that uh, the official number, this is a, um, a report from the China um, 
with a uh, uh, transplant registry. You see that uh, um, in, in the, in the uh, last 12 months, we can see uh, active uh, operation or emergency operation was almost uh, was uh, 26 percent, uh, over 1,000. Emergency transplantation means that the organs were found within three days. <coughs> the larger portion of the organs were found within three days in the time that China has no organ donation system. So I think uh, for this, it is very clear. In this time period, the real organ source cannot be the, the executed. Execution can make a small part, but cannot be the major part of sources for organ transplantation. Okay? So let's see, uh, after 2015, so China said that uh, um, they had an uh, organ donation system, now it's everything uh, legal. So uh, this is based on uh, um, voluntary organ donation, it's the only source. We just compare this with the situation in, in the US. Um, so at the end of 2017, US has 138 million people registered as, as organ donors. In China, it was only 373,000. So that, that's a very actual number. Uh, and I told you, I told us it's one million. One million compared to 130 million. It's nothing. So if you believe that China's organ donation, organ transplant is normal, I think you are crazy. <laughs> but, but the officials in the transplant society, the international society for transplantation, they believe that in China is everything normal. So that's the sad situation. So in US, from this registered donor, the result was 5,000 um, real donor. And the other 5,000 are from not registered people who died in the ICU, they became donors. So the total number of voluntary donors was 10,000. Yeah? In China, <laughs> the number is very low, registered number. And they say that we have still, we have 5,000 <laughs> from ICUs. So the non-consent, uh, uh, non-registered. Um, it is not to believe if people do not want to register themselves as, as organ donors, how they are willing to donate the organs uh, in the ICUs. But even if these 5,000 organ donations are true from ICUs, it can support, you know, it's much very good uh, from 5,000, you can have uh, 15,000 organs in the kidney, but perhaps also a heart, and so, so this is possible. Theoretically, but it can never leading to a waiting time of days and weeks. So in the US, they have uh, 130 million of registered donors. The waiting time is for years. So even there is indeed this 5,000, even, even if it's true, the waiting time must be years. Not just like in the US, but this is also the case. And, uh, how can we get uh, evidence? <coughs> so these are in a group of journalists from South Korea. They managed to get into the Tianjin Hospital. And uh, here we can see the China said that from 2006, not a single foreigner uh, got organ transplanted in, in China in 2016. Yeah? And uh, we can see uh, this journalist have interviewed uh, um, patients from South Korea in this hospital. And uh, is, uh, this hospital has uh, uh, a Korean-speaking nurse that uh, served as a uh, service uh, for the foreign patient. I guess, uh, This is very short, you can see.
So I ended in this top zero. Uh, there are two huge buildings uh, for transplantation, and uh, here you can see at the uh, foyer, uh, there is a, a, a map showing that uh, this is here in this building, one floor, in this building, two floors are dedicated for foreign patient. China has said that they have stopped organ tourism, but this hospital can even open it. Uh, Say that uh, this are uh, only for foreign patients, and uh, we, we, the, the, China, the Korean uh, journalists have found out that in one day, on a single day, eight transplants only for foreign patients. So you can calculate how many patients are transplanted only in this hospital each year. And this is a, a BBC reporter, and he was uh, during his uh, TTS meeting in uh, Madrid. So he, uh, he, he, he found uh, himself a uh, hospital in Guangzhou and uh, pretending that he had liver uh, cirrhosis. So the hospital says that he can get a liver transplant within weeks. So there's another uh, investigation in 2018. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, 10 hospitals were called. Most hospitals said that we can, we can provide a liver within two weeks, one week to two weeks. But uh, some of our patients must wait. Yeah, we must wait four weeks or eight weeks. So four weeks are extremely long for this hospital. So the regular waiting time is one week or two weeks. So can, can you believe that voluntary donation can be the real source for, for this transplantation? Never. Never. And one question, because one, one patient maybe only one organ in 100 person will, will be good for him. Yeah. So there must be 100 people right. that they can take a blood test so one person can get the liver. So the other ones will not fit him. Yeah, right. So why can't yeah. they get these 100 people waiting line, in the queue line, waiting to give organs? It can only it's crazy. be explained mm -hmm. by a living organ donor. Yes, but of course. You know, there must be such a thing. Mm -hmm. So this is the theory. And do you want to have some concrete examples? that uh, doctors are killing? Yes. The one example we have heard uh, uh, by uh, Anna Torgi's talk, here's another publication in Chinese medical journals. Here is kind of the uh, operation was done in 2001, and this was done in a uh, Chinese people's uh, armed police. This is a kind of military hospital. And 2001, <coughs> that's uh, two years before the first uh, or, um, brain death determination was uh, performed. This means that at that time, there was no concept of brain death. So the cardiac death is the, uh, the, the standard. Here you can see uh, how they remove the heart. So first uh, they uh, used the heparin. It among only makes sense uh, to use heparin if the circulation is working. Yeah? Yeah. So the heart is working, the circulation is working, the, the person, the, the so-called donor, is alive. Here you can also see the heart is working and the heart beating is stopped by the doctors with cold potassium solution. So this is a living person. The doctors stop the heart beat, so kill the person and take the heart from it. This is not that the person is first killed and then the organ harvesting. No. The killing is done by organ harvesting. So this is, uh, was in the time uh, without a brain death concept. China has started a brain death uh, determination in 2000, uh, since 2003, not legal, because there is a still to today no uh, leg legislation for brain death. But still, the doc says that no law allows this, but no law prevents this. So that's why they are doing this since 2003. So to perform organ uh, brain death determination, Three criteria must be fulfilled, a deep coma or the uh, absence of brainstem reflex, and also there is no spontaneous respiration. How to prove this? There is no um, spontaneous respiration. The person is surely on uh, ventilation, and the doctor must stop the ventilator and wait eight to ten minutes to see whether the respiration comes or not. Yeah? This means that to perform brain death determination, the patient must be already on a ventilator. So you stop the ventilator, you see. Okay? But in many Chinese medical publications, 
We say that after the donors bring death, they perform intubation for mechanical ventilation. So this is very clear. There was no brain death determination. There's not a brain death patient. And uh, if you look at how they remove the heart, again, also here, you can see the used the heparin, the heart is working, and uh, the heart is beating, and the doctors used a solution to stop the heart. Not a brain death, not cardiac death. So again, living people killed by the doctors and removed the heart. There are many such examples. So the doctors actually revealed themselves that they are killing people and uh, removing organs. There is another example. This is uh, very famous, very famous in China because um, the guy who performed this uh, operation is the vice minister of health in China. And uh, he was uh, in 2005 in Xinjiang. And uh, he had a patient, uh, and he thought that this patient is uh, perfect to perform uh, auto transplantation because uh, the patient had uh, liver cancer. So he uh, removed the liver and cut the cancer and put the liver back again. This has never been done before in China. So this would be the first. So he was very uh, um, uh, cautious. He said that uh, if uh, something goes wrong, I need a backup liver. So before he performs the operation, he phone called uh, uh, two cities in Chongqing and in Guangzhou, asking asking for a backup liver. And uh, liver matching liver was found within hours. Again, this was in the time China had China had no organ donation system. And uh, on the next day, the liver arrived from Chongqing. A, a couple of uh, hours later, another liver came from Lanzhou, uh, from Guangzhou. So from the 19 uh, o'clock, the operation started. It was a very complicated uh, operation, so it lasted the whole night. So on the next morning, operation was finished, but the patient had complication. So that's why they observed the patient for one whole day. If on the next day, they said the transplantation it was successful, and the backup labor is no longer needed. If you look up at the, the backup labor, the backup labor arrived in Xinjiang uh, at uh, 6 o'clock. The flight is at least uh, 6 hours. This means that the liver was removed in that afternoon at uh, 2 o'clock. How long it takes at this time? It was over 40 hours at that time when, uh, the, uh, when the, uh, the experts said that we do not need this river, uh, liver anymore. But in the case that the operation failed, he said that we needed the liver. Can he use this liver? No, 40 hours, the liver can no longer be used. The maximum time is 15 hours. Do they know this? Of course they know this, they are experts. But how do they do this? Why do they do this? They are living. The only explanation is that such a liver that are delivered from Guangzhou to Xinjiang from a uh, human body. Yeah, mm -hmm. and not liver, <coughs> are human bodies. In case we need it, we kill the person, take the liver. In case we do not need it, it can be sent back at it. So another example, the Wang Yijun, uh, Ethan Goodman has told about him. He got a prize and, uh, for a transplantation research. He's not a, a medical doctor. And uh, his, uh, in his uh, research, uh, there was a thousand, several thousand transplantation involved. He said that. Yeah? Uh, that was in the time official source is only execution. We said that uh, for, uh, each year that was several thousand. The, 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 the study happened from 2003 to 2006, so less than three years. This means that in whole China, the execution cannot be more than 12,000. He was a police officer in Lanzhou City with three million. So how many execution can happen during these three years of time in his city? Less than 30. He used thousands of people for his transplantation research. So this means that the majority of donors he killed are not uh, criminals. How we find this? Uh, this is a military doctor in Jinzhou city, and he was very famous. Um, the local newspaper reported that he 
He alone has trans uh, trans uh, performed uh, over 500 transplantation, and he was one of the collaborator, uh, collaboration partner of Wang Lijun, of his police uh, officer, for his transplant research. That's why when uh, Wang Lijun was, uh, was arrested, and uh, five people from uh, North America tried to um, uh, investigate this, they called this doctor and asked him, so I'm from the government, I'm from the uh, investigation team, and uh, Wang Lijun told us, that uh, you used his organs, you are the, uh, one of his uh, uh, transplantation partner. The doctor says that um, not only me, but also China Medical University. So then, then the, the, the caller asked that Wang Jin has already admitted that some of the organs were from Falun Gong. Can you, can you confirm this? He said that all those cases were went through the court. Went through the court does not, does not mean that the people were uh, convicted to death. There was no, not a single death sentence for Falun Gong. This means that the use of Falun Gong organs are killing for, um, for, um, uh, for organs. So um, at last, I want to explain you what is live organ harvesting. It's okay. <laughs> you heard that uh, live organ harvesting we, 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 something for, for the people in the West. That's perhaps the point that you cannot believe. You know, live organ harvesting, the living people are killed for the organ. Actually, it's nothing new. Because in China, in your case, this was very early. This is the first type of uh, organ harvesting. This is during the execution. The regular execution is to the head. But if you wait after head shot, uh, shot um, which the, the, the people is dead, and takes the organs, the organs are not for good quality. That's why you get a body not dead. Because um, um, if the doctors pay a little money to the officers, or give uh, him some uh, cigarettes, and the officers are willing not to kill the people, so not uh, to uh, place the gunshot to the head, but to deliver the gunshot to the right chest. That is not the only case. There are many other cases known. So this is uh, the, the one uh, type of uh, organ harvesting, uh, live, by shooting. I don't know why. Because this, this is, uh, this, um, you can see uh, the second type is, uh, is a system, and it's legal in China. Let me ask you while it's while uh, we're searching for a signal here. Let me ask you uh, one question. Uh, the, we uh, need also to pass on if we're going to include the panel, are we? Yeah, we are. No, then um, this should be the last question, um, the first and the last question. Uh, what response do you get when you present this? Uh, evidence to the Chinese authorities. I mean, this is clear cut. Yes. What do they say when you present it to them? <laughs> if they want to listen. <laughs> yeah, but what do they say? Uh, you, you can you can you can see how the Chinese government uh, responds. So in uh, um, on twenties uh, uh, in July this year, um, uh, uh, an official bank. And the official from uh, um, uh, government, China, uh, German government, from the uh, foreign uh, ministry, has made a statement about the 20 years uh, uh, persecution of Falun Gong, and also uh, mentioned about the organ harvesting report. And uh, there is a re response from the Chinese embassy. He <laughs> says that the, the Falun Gong people is uh, making propaganda. That's it. Yeah, I know, but have you got any reaction to those figures you're presenting here? Uh, the reports are known. So you mean, you, you can see very clearly how the Chinese government responds. Yeah. Renown re re response only was denied. Yeah. Yeah. Without yeah. going yeah. through the evidence. They yeah. cannot no. deny our Excellent. evidence. No. They cannot, they can only deny just... Uh, the they have message. not tried, even tried it's to not possible. refute this. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Big hand. <laughs> and, uh, okay. What should be done? 
And please, no lectures, just short two sentence answers. So we start here. Okay. And then you choose who you want to pass it. <laughs> <laughs> what can be done? Okay. What should be done? First of all, publicly condemn <coughs> organ harvesting. Publicly, not behind a closed door in you know, uh, human rights dialogue between China and a uh, democratic country. That's, that's a short term thing. Immediately condemn them. Second thing, long term, promote the traditional culture of China because culture is the, is the bar bar barrier of moral and ethic. And only because the moral and ethic is so damaged in China, this can happen. So long term, we have to do that. And third thing, only three, okay? Third thing we need to do is promote information freedom to the Chinese people. Chinese people are as clever as we. But the problem is they don't get access to the right information or to all information. So that's we should do it. And I told this to almost all European governments. And I don't know why nothing happened. Probably I'm not so good. Pass the mic. Right. Uh, in my opinion, is uh, <coughs> the world we should divide into two. One is China and the rest of the world. So the medical association or medical society of the rest of the world boycott Chinese medical system. Don't um, refuse to teach Chinese students medicine, refuse to accept uh, the Chinese surgeon's um, article, and they refuse to cooperate with them. Only by doing this, the world will show to the Chinese surgeon the thing you are doing is wrong. Actually, the evidence for organ harvesting is very clear. <coughs> Even the lowest member cannot be explained. And we talk about uh, this with a lot of uh, German politicians. And the politicians who listen to us want to do something. But the government as a whole is saying that they, they do not want to, uh, to, to, to do anything because they want to have a business with China. So the official statement to last year was that so and we know there are some reports, but we cannot uh, prove whether uh, it is true because in China there is no transparency. If you have this excuse, very 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 simple for the government. We do not, uh, as long as we do not deliver the evidence, we were not obligated to do anything. But uh, now I think the China Tribunal has done this. Thing. The government said that they cannot prove the evidence. The China Tribunal has done the work for them. So they have analyzed the uh, report, and I think the government in the West have no excuse anymore. They must do something. Yeah. Uh, I think that the healthcare systems uh, outside of China uh, and the transportation system should be improved so that demand is taken away, so that these foreigners have no reason to go to China to, to use the system. And I think also that the kind of uh, fact-finding that Mr. Over There is doing is, is, is wonderful to see that. And I hope that uh, more uh, people will, will, will keep on doing that. That, 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 that impresses, really. Good. Benjamin? Um, I, I think organ harvesting is uh, uh, beyond many people's imagination is so evil, so evil. Um, and this happen, has happened, and it is happening. I think we, we, we should do what we can to stop the evil, to stand at the side of conscience. Ethan? Um, at the high level, uh, the highest levels, it's uh, governmental level. It's ban organ tourism to China. Very simple action. Don't tell me no you from Sweden goes. That's not safe. They said the same thing in the UK. Until I went off and interviewed a guy in Birmingham and got his kidney in Xi'an Military Hospital. Okay? So it's never true. There's always somebody going. It's very simple. You ban it. No country has paid a penalty for banning it. The second thing that can be done is obviously what the member just said, which is on the medical world, they must put a firewall. Exactly the same one we have with Soviet psychiatrists. 
no contact. Mm -hmm. Nobody publishes in a journal. You're not invited to the conferences. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, nothing. You have to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. We can't, we can't, we're not going to start bombing your railways, but you've got to solve this problem. Get back to us when you have. And that helped till the end of the Cold War. On the activist level, is the final level, is, look, there are people in this room who have very little power. You can't make anything like that happen. I urge you to do one thing. Talk to your doctor. Talk to your dentist. I talk to anyone who's in the medical world because they hold the real cards in this, this game. Uh, they're the ones who need to feel that pressure coming from the grassroots, and it can be very effective. All right, before I hand over the mic to, to Caroline, I will uh, ask you one final uh, question. Um, I'll ask you about the take-home message from today, from this evening. What has, um, what has stuck to your mind when you have been listening to your fellow speakers? If you have to bring something with you from this room that you heard here tonight that didn't come out of your own mouth, what would it be? Uh, I think it was Benjamin's uh, extremely touching uh, story about what he has experienced in here, which I feel very touched about that. Benjamin, what do you bring home? Um, it's so... Um, I, I, I feel very thankful for that we always have, we, we care about human rights. The, this uh, owner has given this, this evil thing. We, we care about that. So I, I'm, I'm very thank, thankful for that. So thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Ethan? Yeah. Yeah, please, the section of uh, the voluntary organ, this was, that was, uh, I've heard your talk before, but I've never heard it quite that way. It's really, really something. Well, uh, when I listen to my fellow speakers, then for me, I'm just more convinced that this evil deed has been going on just too long time. And we have to stop it for the sake of our own future. And to stop it, I personally think is not enough just with, uh, you know, or, or doing things on the medical community. But we must do it in a much higher level. And first of all, we should do it with ourselves. You know, stop being naive and stop being greedy so that the Chinese communists won't have that much chance to deceive us. For me, well, oh yeah, first I want to make an announcement that, that there's a motion in the Swedish parliament about this one. It's going to be very, very soon. So please support it. Secondly, when I sit there, or when I receive an invitation, go to somewhere and give a talk on this issue, I actually felt sorry. Why? It was 2009 when I joined the Ethan Gutman. And 10 years on, we are still going traveling to the world, and it's still try to tell people the things happening there. Ten years on, how many people have killed already? Yeah. That's why I, how I felt a little... So, so that's the take-home yeah. message? You're going to do this ten more years? No. 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 I, so wish, I wish I'm going to retire from this, mm -hmm. if I can. Yeah. Hopefully, you don't have to do it ten more years. I see this is the time is coming soon because uh, what for me uh, the most uh, important point for this evening uh, is uh, the organization because uh, during the last uh, 20 years uh, it was only the victims who are fighting for themselves and uh, uh, Falun Gong has uh, newspapers, has uh, TVs that's why a lot of journalists that uh, they are making propaganda for themselves no because other people don't speak for them. They, 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 that's why they are uh, found into their own uh, news agency newspapers. This is a crime to fight for themselves. And uh, Matas, uh, David Matas told me that uh, in the history, you, you can look back, it was the Jews who fought for themselves. It was always the victims who fight by themselves. And uh, that's why uh, it's this uh, 
you, you must fight for themselves, if you matter to the Palamu Park gentlemen. But uh, today, uh, this is uh, another independent organization who event, uh, uh, organized this event. I'm very happy about this. I think the, the world, uh, uh, the whole situation is changing. And uh, the, at least in the US, the politicians have recognized the difference between China and Chinese people. And uh, we must wait. And I, I guess that I think I feel that uh, people are getting uh, awake. So that's why I'm very happy, very thankful for, for uh, Caroline uh, to the organizer. Okay, please share she wants to address the panel. Yes. I, I would just like to say a few things before we leave tonight. Um, first of all, again, uh, thank you all for being here. It's, uh, I don't think anyone in this room will sleep well tonight. Um, and uh, I'm glad to hear that you bring up uh, the witnesses. You talk about uh, the courage and uh, not to mention the courage of yourself. And we're here tonight to talk about the Edelstein Prize, which is, uh, was actually established in my grandfather's name and spirit. And uh, he did many courageous things, uh, but just to, uh, and this prize actually exists to support those people who dare to make a difference. My grandfather died as a very lonely man. I mean, his family, friends, and his, uh, the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs turned their back on him. Uh, after saving uh, more than 1,500 people in Chile, more than uh, 500 Jews in Norway during the Second World War. So it is important to, to actually have the courage to stand up for those uh, that are not strong enough. Uh, so, just a very official uh, thing about this evening is that I hereby declare the nomination, <laughs> call for nominations for next year's prize open. I want to say that the prize actually uh, makes a difference for, for people. Uh, Lee Wen Su, last year's um, laureate, her husband was listed as a prisoner of conscience um, at the Amnesty International. Uh, so there's another organization advocating for his freedom. Uh, as you're all traveling, um, I would like to, um, I would love to give you flowers, but we are sort of compensating for the climate. So I will give you a symbol of civic courage, which is that my grandfather, uh, while saving people in Chile, always wore a toothbrush in his uh, jacket because he didn't know where he was going to sleep that night. So, here you will all get the toothbrush. <laughs> so, thank you so much all for coming. Thank you everyone who has been participating in organizing this event. It's been, uh, we are several organizations. I would like to say thank you on behalf of them. Uh, thank you for all the people contributing to this evening and I think it is a very important event. It is a historical event, collect, uh, gathering people uh, and uh, providing some sort of resistance to the Chinese uh, Communist Party. Thank you so much.